Hello, my name is Richard Deming, and I'm Director of Creative Writing in the English Department at Yale University. This semester I was teaching a class on Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emily Dickinson, and Herman Melville. And when we switched to teaching online, a number of my students emailed me uh, from the, wherever they were in their homes and their apartments um, all across the country, all across the world. And they were wrestling with trying to live the life of the mind while being in their different situations. And they were emailing me and asking me how to think about writing, how to think about literature, how to think about thinking when this pandemic is going on, when it makes everything else seem small and, and maybe unimportant. And I thought immediately of Emerson's essay experience. It's probably his masterpiece, published in 1844 in Essay's second series. It was written two years after the death of his son, Waldo. Waldo died at the age of five of scarlet fever, and the grief racked the family. What's interesting about experience is that it is an essay about grief and it is an essay in which Emerson does briefly mention his son, but otherwise Waldo doesn't appear much in the essay. That's not uncommon for Emerson. Most of his essays had very little of his own life uh, as part of it. But there is this uh, allusion to the death of his son that changes our understanding of the essay. So I wanted to read just the last paragraph and then talk a little bit about it. I know that the world I converse with in the city and in the farms is not the world I think. I observe that difference and shall observe it. One day I shall know the value in the law of this discrepance, but I have not found that much was gained by manipular attempts to realize the world of thought. Many eager persons successively make an experiment in this way and make themselves ridiculous. They acquire democratic manners, they foam at the mouth, they hate and deny. Worse, I observe that in the history of mankind, there is never a solitary example of success taking their own tests of success. I say this polemically, or in reply to the inquiry, why not realize your world? But far be from me the despair which prejudges the law by a paltry empiricism, since there never was a right endeavor, but it succeeded. Patience and patience we shall win at the last. We must be very suspicious of the deceptions of the element of time. It takes a good deal of time to eat or to sleep or to earn a hundred dollars and a very little time to entertain a hope and an insight which becomes the light of our life. We dress our garden, eat our dinners, discuss the household with our wives, and these things make no impression, are forgotten next week. But in the solitude to which every man is always returning, he has a sanity and revelations, which in his passage into new worlds he will carry with him. Never mind the ridicule, never mind the defeat. Up again, old heart, it seems to say, there is victory yet for all justice, and the true romance which the world exists to realize will be the transformation of genius into practical power. So I thought of that particular paragraph in that particular essay because Emerson's essay is really about teaching us how to grieve and how to, what's more to transform grief into an understanding that the world is given to change. Um, many people have cited the idea that philosophy, that the role of philosophy is to teach us how to die. Emerson seems to want to teach us that change is everything. And that if we truly understand that everything changes at every moment, we have a different relationship to grief, we have a different relationship to loss. It doesn't make those things easy. It doesn't, it doesn't make them somehow something that doesn't affect our lives. But it gives us a way of understanding grief and loss as being the thing which most humanizes us and which makes the things that are around us, from the people we love, to the coffee that we drink every day, to the flowers, to the play of light on the wall, makes these things all the more important because they're given to change. Everything is given to change.
And that's not something necessarily to fear, but to acknowledge and to find a way to live with. So when my students were asking me, how do we live the life of the mind? What is the literature in a time of this? I thought of that and realized that the work of art and the work of literature has to go on because it teaches us how to live, not in the best of times, but in the worst of times. It teaches us that there are others who struggle with what it means to be human in the worst of times. And in that becomes something that is a presence of empathy that continues to be felt, as in the case of Emerson, over 150 years later. We might not change the world every time we write, but we might change ourselves. We might change ourselves into something that we want to be, which is present to the very life that we're living.